Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys. All right. History graph. Um, Britain's triumph, the surrender of the German high seas fleet. Let's go. Let's go right into it. All, all the things. Hit all the things. I sort of want In November to... 1918, the First World War was ended by an arm... I just want to get an ice cube. And I want to get comfy. Let's go. In November 1918, the First World War was ended by an armistice signed in the forests of Compagnie. The victorious Allies moved to neutralize the Imperial Navy. Germany was ordered to surrender the core of its mighty high- Sorry, isn't this a real thing? Didn't... Um... After Germany in the Second World War conquered France, didn't Hitler bring the same uh, railway car to uh, sign... I gotta wake up. Alright, let's go. Seize fleet to Allied internment at what was eventually decided to be Scarpa Flow in Scotland. Waiting to escort these ships into imprisonment would be the most powerful fleet of battleships ever put to sea. The Grand Fleet. Oh, by the way, someone asked me, I just found out, Littleborough, I think, Lancashire, was the city my, uh, or the town my grandfather's side of the family. All right, let's go. The fate of the German high seas fleet was a key sticking point in the armistice negotiations in November 1918. Initially, the German naval representative, Captain Vanislow, had insisted that the Imperial fleet could not be interned since it had not been invested in combat. The British First Sea Lord, Admiral Weems, had grimly replied that if that was what was needed, the Germans had only to leave port. When the armistice was eventually signed, it required the Kaiserlich Marina to surrender 10 of its latest battleships, 6 battle cruisers, 8 light cruisers and its 50 most modern destroyers. This was in addition to all of its U-boats which were ordered to surrender at Harwich to Commodore Reginald Tyrwhitt. From November 20th to the start of December, 176 German submarines presented themselves to the British in Operation Deadlight. It was a fairly low-key event with each sub secured by British sailors before the German crew was sent home. The surrender of the German high seas fleet, however, was to be not even remotely low-key, not least because of Admiral Sir David Beatty's desire for an emphatic statement of Britain's naval dominance. BT was the commander-in-chief of the Grand Fleet. Look, I understand that you have to send a message with a, you know, when a treaty, and it's a little bit naive to say, you know, why not just call it quits and end the war and not hammer Germany into the ground so bad. Um... But I, I can't stop thinking if some of the animus that allowed uh, in the German public that even allowed the chance of someone like Hitler coming to power might have this may I'm I don't have a firm opinion on this maybe fed into the possibility of such a uh, controversial figure. Um, you know, rising in power in Germany. The naval dominance. BT was the commander-in-chief of the Grand Fleet, the formation in the Royal Navy which had faced off against the high seas fleet across the North Sea for the last four years. It was by far the most powerful Allied naval formation, and by 1918 had a weight of naval firepower the likes of which the world has never seen before or since. BT's opposite number, the German Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Franz von Hipper, could not bring himself to lead his fleet into captivity, so the task fell to Rear Admiral Ludwig von Reuter. Before dawn on November 21st, 1918, the light cruiser HMS Cardiff left the Firth of Forth, 
to meet the German fleet and lead them west. In each class of ship, the Germans had one ship fewer than was specified by the armistice. The battleship Koenig and light cruiser Dresden had engine trouble, while the battlecruiser Mackensen was still under construction and not seaworthy. At 9.30am, the Did High Seas fleet met the Grand Fleet, which turned to form two parallel lines six miles apart, either side of the German ships. In total, the Grand Fleet numbered 33 battleships, 12 battlecruisers, 34 light cruisers and 120 destroyers, which took up station at the rear. It was an awesome gathering of naval firepower, designed to underline to the Germans the scale of Allied naval supremacy and put any thought about a last minute blaze of glory to rest. Give After a couple years. of hours steaming west, the High Seas Fleet and its vast escort arrived at Inchkeith in the Firth of Forth, and by noon the German ships I'm were- I'm sorry, just something about this, um, doesn't sit right with me. It wasn't as if it was, you know, the Soviet army per, um, parading uh, Nazis through the streets who had been fighting with them and was betrayed by them, or the treaty was, was it Brest-Litovsk? Um, you know, the treaty that they had when they took over Poland together. And so they betrayed you and they murdered thousands and put people in camps and all this. And so the anger is there. So I, I can at least say, okay, I, I can't imagine being that angry at a nation, at an army, who killed so many of my fellow soldiers in such a seemingly unfair way. I'm no professor. But it just seems like this is overkill. Overkill to the point where what's going to come to bite you and the U.S. and everyone in... in what, 19 years, eight, 20 years? It's just like World War One wasn't so cut and dry of this side's e evil, this side's not. And it, was, it seems irresponsible on the part of the Allies, the way the treaty was done and the way the embarrassment of the German army after World War One was done. And uh, my opinion can change, but that's what I... Those are my thoughts. ...were moored, watching the Grand Fleet steam past. As the British flagship HMS Queen Elizabeth passed the High Seas Fleet, Beatty signalled, the German flag will be hauled down at sunset today and will not be hoisted again without permission. Let me know if I'm wrong if this, this is was standard technically procedure. a breach of the armistice, since until any peace treaty was agreed, the ships remained in Germany's possessions and should have been allowed to fly their colours. But as the sun set, the Imperial Naval Ensign followed it, and the High Seas Fleet began its captivity. That evening, Admiral Beatty held a Thanksgiving service and dinner, and basked in the glory Ooh, like of a that. fleet triumphant. What Beatty and the others might not have realised though was Sorry, that, I was distracted by that the evening, painting. Admiral Beatty held a Thanksgiving service and dinner, and basked in the glory of a fleet triumphant. Ooh, look how nice that is. I was distracted again. All right, I'm sorry. For a Thanksgiving service and dinner, and basked in the glory of a fleet triumphant. What Beatty and the others might not have realised, though, was that the events of that day represented, in my opinion, the high watermark of British naval power. It capped more than a century of naval dominance on a scale the world had not previously seen. When its power had been challenged from across the North Sea, the Royal Navy had redeveloped its ships and amassed the world's most powerful fleet defeating its challenger at sea and taking its entire remaining fleet into captivity. At that moment on that night, the Royal Navy had become the world's largest and most powerful navy by a terrifying margin. Come on, US. But like all things, this wouldn't last. The Grand Fleet was far too large to be economical after the end of the war and much of it would have to be scrapped. Britain's American ally was in the process of building a large modern fleet of its own and by 1922, Britain would be signing up to international naval limits to prevent a future arms race it knew it could not win. As the decades rolled by, after the Second World War, the Royal Navy would never return to the scale of dominance that it possessed in November 1918. I know battleships are the go-to today. There's, I, I hear some talk on some military channels that battleships might 
become obsolete in a few decades. But there's something about a battleship that I said. Wait, did I say battleship? If I said battleship, I meant aircraft carrier. Jesus. There's something about a battleship that is just, it's just cool, you know? It's just seeing all those guns and just the way it's constructed. And the, an aircraft carrier just doesn't look as cool. Cool is the best word I can come up with, honestly, right now. But for now, that was all in the future. Over the closing weeks of 1918, the German fleet was accompanied north to Scarpa Flow, where it was joined by the battleship Baden for long-term internment. On arrival, the German ships were reduced to skeleton crews, and seven long months of captivity began. While stuck in a British harbour, Admiral von Reuter's main challenge was keeping control of his fleet's crew. Revolutionary fervour was gripping the port towns in Germany, and this had extended to the sailors of the high seas fleet. All of von Reuter's orders had to be countersigned by a workers' council. Discipline was almost non-existent, and he ended up shifting his flag from the battleship Friedrich de Grossa to the light cruiser Emden after one group of sailors took to stomping on his cabin when he was trying to sleep. Concerned that there might be a fully-fledged attempt at mutiny, von Reuter had to secure assurances from the British that they would help him restore control if such an event took place. While the German admiral played cat and mouse with his men, in Paris the fate of the high seas fleet was being decided by diplomats. The French and Italians wanted to be awarded a quarter of the fleet each, while the British were keen for the entire fleet to just be destroyed. The last thing the Admiralty wanted were ex-German battleships running around the Mediterranean, whichever flag they flew. Discussions rolled on into 1919 until matters came to a head in June. Woodrow! On so many of the presidential tier- I'm getting very pause happy, I know, but... It's my third- alright. On almost every, uh, like, historian, I've only seen, like, three, but I've, I've seen Mr. Beat. I think I saw Mr. Terry History, maybe one more, of presidential tier lists. He's almost always, or is always, at the bottom. And so, I, I need to learn more about American history, too, and uh, presidents. Um, sure, maybe I could probably name them all, but or most of them, but I, I'm not well learned in, uh, point is I have to learn more about American history as much as any other kind of history. And so he's always in the bottom tier. I'd like to learn why. Discussions rolled on into 1919 until matters came to a head in June. The Germans were reluctant to accept the punitive peace terms demanded by the Allies and had put forward a set of counter-proposals I don't blame which them. included things like them retaining control over land the Allies wanted ceded to Poland. For example, Danzig. The Allies were having none of this, and on June 16th handed the Germans a response which was published in British newspapers the following day. The Allies refuted the bulk of German demands and ramped up pressure on their opponents in the final paragraph. The Allied and Associated Powers therefore require a declaration from the German delegation within five days that they are prepared to sign the treaty as now amended so a time limit for acceptance that would expire on June 21st. And, in default of such a declaration, the armistice will then terminate and the Allied and Associated Powers will take such steps as they think needful to enforce their terms. This is a long way to say that hostilities would resume if Germany refused to agree to the Allied terms. Now, here's the important bit for the High Seas Fleet. Because British- Let me know if I'm wrong about uh, the uh, Treaty of Versailles, you know, I'm, my opinion can be changed. Now, here's the important bit for the High Seas Fleet. Because British newspapers were not delivered to the German fleet until three days after publication, von Reuter heard about this deadline on June 20th, just a day before its expiry. The Admiral and his officers knew that the resumption of war would mean the Royal Navy seizing the High Seas Fleet, and it was decided that they were not going to allow that. A long-standing order dictated that no German ship should be allowed to fall into enemy hands, and von Reuter intended to maintain that. Orders were given to prepare the fleet to be scuttled the following day. On the morning of June 21st, 1919, the British battleship squadron guarding Scarpa Flow went to sea. Its commander, Vice Admiral Sir Sidney Fremantle, 
knew that the deadline for peace had been extended to June 23rd, a development nobody had thought to inform von Reuter of. Fremantle planned to take his five Rental Revenge class battleships to inform von Reuter of. Fremantle planned to take his five Revenge class battleships for exercises and return on the 23rd, ready to seize the German fleet if need be. Von Reuter, believing the British would seize his fleet at any moment, was not about to give Fremantle time to return to port. At noon, every German ship in Scarpa Flow once again raised the Imperial Ensign and began to scuttle themselves. It took just 16 minutes for the 24,000 ton dreadnought, Friedrich de Grossa, to roll over and sink. Others Wait, so they raised their flags right before sinking them, out of like a symbolic... ...followed it, while a few British destroyers and tugs tried desperately to prevent the sinkings. There were instances of British personnel opening fire on lifeboats to force Wait. the crews back onto their ships. The captain of the battleship Mark Graf was shot dead on his bridge by a Royal Marine amidst the chaos. In the Wait, battleship what? Mark Graf I'm an idiot, I'm sorry. I've been terrible at rewinding this video, but I... So they weren't supposed to do that? The ship in Scarpa Flow once again raised the Imperial Ensign and began to scuttle themselves. It took just 16 minutes for the 24,000 ton dreadnought, Friedrich de Grossa, to roll over and sink. Others followed it, while a few British destroyers and tugs tried desperately to prevent the sinkings. There were instances of British personnel opening fire on lifeboats to force the crews so they back would onto rather their it, ships. They sink the captain it, of the battleship Mark Graf was shot dead scuttled. on his bridge by a Royal Marine amidst the chaos. In total, nine or is German sailors were killed and 16 wounded by British gunfire, but in vain. At 2.30pm, Vice Admiral Fremantle arrived back at Scarpa Flow, but it was too late to save the fleet. By 5pm, 15 German dreadnoughts had sunk, while only Baden refused to sink and was beached. Of eight light cruisers, four had I don't care, alright you guys, I'm- what? Okay, so scuttling is sinking the ship. So why are they upset? sunk and four were beached. 32 destroyers were on the bottom, 14 beached and only four remained afloat. Admiral von Reuter was hauled aboard HMS Revenge to be confronted by Fremontel and learned for the first time that the deadline had been extended by two days. Von Reuter was told that he had violated common honour and the honourable traditions of seamen of all nations by his actions. The sinking of the high seas fleet provoked immediate controversy. The French, in particular, were incandescent at the loss of ships they hoped to control. The British protested loudly at the dishonour of von Reuter's act, but privately were pretty relieved that the German fleet had gone to the bottom. Admiral Weems remarked, I look upon the sinking of the German fleet as a real blessing. It disposes once for all the thorny question of the distribution of these ships. Another person who was delighted was Admiral Reinhard Scheer, who had led the High Seas Fleet at the Battle of Jutland in 1916. He said, I rejoice, this last act is true to the best traditions of the German Navy. If you'd like to know more about the scuttling and the immense gathering of ships... That I've never felt like more of an idiot than after watching this. I... Um, I know what I'll do. I'm going to go back and watch certain parts. Consider this the end if you're, if you're tired. So, thanks for watching, guys. Um, I'll come back with another video soon. ...to the light cruiser Emden after one group of sailors took to sea. At that moment on that night, the Royal Navy had become the world's largest and most powerful navy by a terrifying margin. But like all things, this wouldn't last. The Grand Fleet was far too large to be economical after the end of the war, and much of it would have to be scrapped. Britain's American ally was in the process of building a large modern fleet of its own, and by 1922 Britain would be signing up to international naval limits to prevent a future arms race it knew it could not win. As the decades rolled by after the Second World War, the Royal Navy would never return to the scale of dominance it possessed in November of 1918. But for now, that was all in the future. Over the closing weeks of 1918, the German fleet was accompanied north to Scarpa Flow, where it was joined by the battleship Bard for long-term internment. On arrival, the German ships were reduced to skeleton crews, and seven long months of captivity began. 
While stuck in a British harbour, Admiral von Reuter's main challenge was keeping control of his fleet's crew. Revolutionary fervour was gripping the port towns in Germany, and this had extended to the sailors of the high seas fleet. All of von Reuter's orders had to be countersigned by a workers' council. Discipline was almost non-existent, and he ended up shifting his flag from the battleship Friedrich de Grossa to the light cruiser Emden after one group of sailors took the stomping on his cabin when he was trying to sleep. Concerned that there might be a fully fled attempt at mutiny, von Reuter had to secure assurances from the British that they would help him restore control if such an event took place. While the German admiral played cat and mouse with his men, in Paris the fate of the high seas fleet was being decided by diplomats. The French and Italians wanted to be awarded a quarter of the fleet each, while the British were keen for the entire fleet to just be destroyed. Okay, I think I get it. Okay, I think I get it. I get it now. So, the the they were going to distribute the ships among France and Italy, and I guess uh, the UK, or destroy it all. We're going to receive ships. And the Germans thought that was completely, uh, you know, a slap in the face to kind of, you know, rules of war, tradition, rules of surrender, whatnot. And so they'd rather sink the ship or scuttle it, which is the same thing, than have it fall into enemy hands. I got it. Took me a while, but I got it. All right. Uh, I might do another video. If not, see you guys tomorrow for the uh, start of a new series. See you then.